So obviously we all know this, but tell us the, your name and spell it, and also uh, the organization that you want to be identified with when we put it in the lower third. Actually, it doesn't matter because okay. we're not going to My name is it. Melissa Michaels, M-E-L-I-S-S-A, -S Michaels, M-I-C-H-A-E-L-S. I am affiliated deeply with Golden Bridge. Okay, great. Yeah, that's really for the transcriber. So who initiated you, and <sighs> how did you get to be the woman that you are today? Uh, I think the Great Spirit has initiated me and continues to, to be really honest. Life has been a potent um, path of initiation. It doesn't seem to be stopping. But formally, in um, conventional sense of the word, where were my initiations that were not life crises that I had to find my way through, of which there were many, many. But I was initiated by both Gabrielle Roth in the lineage of the five rhythms, I was formally initiated by Reverend Ron Roth, which is so awesome that I had these two divergent streams, lineages, and they both had the potent masculine and the wide open feminine with the same last name. And when those two happened for me, um, I felt a very profound union of the masculine and feminine inside of myself. And I've had incredible teachers with um, who've offered me many doorways for um, parts of my initiation, Tamara Slayton being one of the primary ones who uh, started and built the um, initiative for cultural renewal, working with the blood mysteries and life and death. And those were really my strongest lineages, although I've been a deep student of many, many other paths. Great. And mm -hmm. Go ahead. Oh, well, that's okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really want to say also that I feel my community continues to initiate me. And the young people that I have raised up and parented and also mentored and, and, and brought through our rites of passage processes have been very powerful. Um, not so conscious, not so intentional, but initiators, absolutely. The young people, the parents, my colleagues, and the elders, there's something in the crucible of this particular community that continues to be a, an, uh, an init a path of initiation. And intimate relationship has also been a very profound path of initiation for me mm. throughout the course of my life. Well, great. Well, that you answered sort of two questions in one there, which is that I have for you, initiation and mentorship. So, yeah. Um, well, there are many people who've mentored me along the way that um, a really extraordinary group of women and men who've tended me and parented me and given me tools for transformation, for healing and awakening in my own life, and also that have woven in to my work, to this work, to this lineage. And I carry them very close in my heart very, very close. And, um, you know, people who picked me up and really uh, helped me find my way till I could walk on my own throughout the course of my life. Nice. You know, I'm thinking maybe I should get my headphones uh -huh. and listen, so, so bear with me a moment, just so I can Take your make sure we don't have too much wind noise. So since, in a sense, we already touched on that, let me go ahead and ask you, how do you conceptualize initiation and mentorship relative to each other? And if you, if you don't have an answer, that, that's fine too. I mean... So, so the work that I have found myself engaged in has many components to it. And I was working in the field of education. I was guiding, I was um, bringing forth new thought and drawing out the intelligence of young people really throughout the course of my life. So I've always known myself or I've s been reflected by the world as an educator. And that goes all the way back to when I ran my first summer camp at 12 years old. And over the years in my deep um, response to what was being asked of me, 
I found myself doing more and more mentoring, which is really um, aligning with the soul, the emerging soul consciousness of a young person and walking with them and assisting them as those the colors of their true nature come into uh, uh, what's the word full brightness come be, become clear to themselves and so I have done years and years of mentoring of young people it's just the most natural thing in the world for me of you know what's ailing you what is hurting what are you what are you longing for what are your questions where are the gaps um, what are the gifts? What are you attracted to? And how can they all fit together in some kind of alchemical way that really is an expression of your true nature? And so I spend so much time sitting with young people and in these kinds of conversations, helping build bridges with them to people who can assist them and help them develop the tools that they need to manifest their nature, their true nature, their soul's call, helping them really look at how they're going to work with the ways in which their lives are fragmented inwardly and outwardly, sitting with them and talking about um, what they see in the world and how they would like to assist in the collective renewal that um, we are all aspiring to help uh, bring forth. And so I, I live and breathe those conversations. It's just how I've pretty much lived my entire adult life and even before my adult life. When I was, um, when I was a teenager and, and involved in illegal activities, there were always younger kids around me and we would engage in these kinds of deep conversations. That's just sort of how one of the, one of the real threads of my own soul's na uh, nature. And the initiatory piece really has grown out of my understanding of s different facets of the medicine coming through me and the lineages that I come from and the needs of the young people in front of me and around me. And when I came to understand more about my own biography and what has allowed me to really heal and transform and move forward, I realized that threshold experiences was an integral part of conscious thresholds that were experiences that were able to complete in productive ways was critical for the um, awakening of my full self onto this in, into life. So I began to just really study what I was already doing for myself and what I was seeing going on around me that wasn't productive initiatory experiences. We know many, many um, stories of whether it's dist uh, um, why am I not thinking? Well, whether it's cutting or binging and purging or straight up violence towards self and other or promiscuity or, you know, the simpler ones of fast driving and, you know, small petty thefts, you know, that we know the long list of ways in which young people are actually having experiences that expand their consciousness or it's the incredible amount of death that this generation has had to face and the ways in which they've been blown open as a result of it. But what, I, what we all know is that there isn't a productive way for these young people to return from these initiatory experiences if they even survive them. And um, I often, yeah, so I became very interested in how the work that I've already done with myself and I was naturally doing in community through the dance could become a very potent doorway for an initiatory path for young people and the adults who serve them, quite honestly. And what I came to realize is we were already doing it. We just needed to, to become even more conscious of it and um, align with the work that was already happening in this community and through us. Am I making sense? Yeah. No, you touched on probably three or four things I'd like to cycle back to. I mean, you talked about, you know, when you were a teen and the experiences that you had. You know, that that's something that I'm always interested in asking, you know, experts like yourself is, you know, how might your own life have been different had you been taken by aunties and uncles in the community and said, we're going to initiate you now, now that you're 13, 14, 15, whatever. Well, it, depend, it would have to depend on who those aunties and uncles were because there were people around me that cared a lot about me in some way or another, but 
we were, but there was such dysfunction and such secrecy around dis the dysfunctions at that time in our generation that I'm not sure that my community around me had the emotional range, the uh, willingness to be transparent about their own processes and really... No, it's speculative. I'm right, okay, so, and with that said, there was a time right around my 21st birthday that I did have, although not set up overtly as an initiatory experience, I did have one that was very productive that I'll speak about in a minute. It was critical. Um, had I had that, I probably would be a healthier person at the level of my nervous system. I wouldn't have spent so many years in terror and so many years in self-destructive dynamics that have worn on me and I've done an incredible amount of um, repair and I have beautiful incredible capacity for resilience and I don't I wouldn't trade that for anything because now I can sit in a room full of all kinds of very highly traumatized activated intense young people and and really be a ground there and be comfortable there so I know it was, it was part of my my story to learn how to navigate my way back from from some hell realms inside my own skin and had I been held in a certain way um, pro probably I also just would have made totally different choices in who I who I created life with as an adult in how I brought my work to the world I you know I think things would have been for sure different in terms of um, the wear and tear on my system but I have I feel so um, I feel humbly grateful for the path that was laid before me and that I've had enough support from the outside from all directions and from the inside to keep choosing life and to keep being born ever more fully into myself and into our community as a result of lots and lots of trauma and 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 drama quite honestly so sure it would have made a difference and um, yet here we are <laughs> and when I was 21 I, I always say I was airlifted by fate I um, many things in my life had led me to feel very connected to, the, to diverse communities around the world. My father was born in Russia, raised in Mexico. I had a um, relationship with, the, with, with people living in cardboard boxes on the banks of the Rio Grande. And my soul had been stirred. My heart had been broken open by many things I'd seen sort of in the inner city and in the, in, on the borders that caused me to know that I had to do something. And that was young for me. And I started with the kids in the neighborhood. Like I said, I ran my first summer camp when I was 12, and the kids were probably nine. <laughs> and throughout the course of my life, I was called into leadership in so many ways with younger kids. Um, but at 21, I really met the woman who has been my spiritual mother in this life, um, who's now pa uh, passed over, passed away, Cyril Schoen, although she's whew. And she introduced me to a community in South India. and through many um, interesting circumstances, I ended up going over there to do architecture work because that's what my undergraduate degree was in. And it was absurd to me that I would be designing buildings for people I knew nothing about. And I said, no, thank you. And I ended up going into the villages. And of course, I couldn't speak the language and I fell totally in love with these children. And I had an, I had an epiphany right there at 21 at that brilliant moment of soul birthing that the children of the world were calling and that movement was our universal language. And um, I was, I was um, taken to a place of such stillness in my being, of such um, understanding that those words, they penetrated me so deeply that my entire life has been answering an answer to that call when I began to understand that um, somehow I was to help bring the children together and find the places where we are connected in a very deep and human way. And many things happened after that to help bring this vision into full color. But that was a pivotal point and Cyril loved me so deeply and that's what you're talking about. It wasn't an initiatory experience that she set up for me. It was her love 
and her seeing of me and not seeing of me through con the context of contemporary American culture that's like, what are you going to do now that you finished your degree in college? She loved me. And that allowed me to open and flower into the call of my own soul. And um, that's what I needed. And, and, you know, Grace gave that to me. And really, here we are. And for many, many years, we would finish our summer camp. And I would bring the young people who were here, who were sticking around, and we'd hop in the car and we'd go see Cyril when she was, you know, a little, little brilliant light of an old lady. And I would just bring them to her and say, here's how we're growing. So um, ultimately, all the clever programs in the world don't do much if there isn't that current that really is the healing force that, that um, allows us all to um, come home to ourselves. And love. I mean, well, that's what I'm speaking you named about. It. Yeah, yeah you that's know. what I'm speaking about is that absolute seeing of me and her love and her willingness to sit with me, to ask hard questions, and to celebrate my becoming. Yeah, no, that's a beautiful capsule definition of mentoring, what it, what it really is comprised of. Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciate your uh, willingness to, to touch the emotion, the joy of that experience again. Yeah. yeah. Well, it was more than joy. It was a lifeline for me, Frederick. And, you know, my parents, bless them, because they're so awesome and they really support my work at this point. But at that time, they were like, hey, is Melissa in a cult? You know, they were like freaked out. What's going on here? And I appreciate that they were asking those questions, but I wasn't really willing to like concern myself with them because I knew that I was on to something that was calling me deeply. Let's, let's talk a little bit about <clears throat> the young people that you do serve. Um, Slightly. Uh, you know, it, it was in conversation with Mark a couple days ago uh, up in uh, Loveland that he actually brought to my attention something that I'd only been dimly aware of. And, and that was that, as I understand it, and, and you'll correct me, uh, you really started out mostly working with, you know, traditional, more at-risk youth and, uh, and sort of average kids, if you will, and uh, have now evolved to a point where you're consciously working with the leaders of tomorrow. I mean, you're, tr you're trying to recruit, you know, the most, uh, well, the, the, young, the young people with the greatest potential for world-changing uh, impact. S so talk about that journey. Well, um, this work grew out of the needs that were all around me, starting with myself. And then, um, my own children and their friends and the kids in the neighborhood whose parents I knew who saw that I had a, I had a heart and a capacity for having conversations with their children that weren't happening anywhere else in the community or that they were not comfortable having with their kids and that um, I was really comfortable bringing out you know, the creative doorways that allow young people to begin to access their true soul's nature. So, you know, for years it was what was going on around and, and literally, you know, I, I, I'm a parent in this, this community, so I, I answered the phone around the clock and I went into parts of town that people weren't going and I walked into parties that were go headed really fast south and I I spoke up at meetings where parents didn't want to look at what was going on and I taught in schools where after a while um, it became clear to me that my work would be more effective outside of schools and we can talk about that so you know I wasn't willing to let a friend of one of my children's die because nobody was paying attention that doesn't work for me and sometimes I had kids that were like two years older, but a little more on the path of their own healing, assisting me because that's all we could pull together for a team, you know? And I mean, I, I ran the uh, security team for the after prom just so that we could create some safety around our children and also some warmth, some kindness, some beauty. 
because I'm, I, I'm not into policing children. I'm into creating environments that allow them to make really positive choices for themselves and supporting one another in doing so. So um, it was always this marriage and has always been of my own soul's uh, evolution, my own creativity wanting to be expressed and the needs of what, what is coming towards me. And um, we've, we've definitely worked with really high risk young people, but I would say that every single person, and I can say this, that has come through cross paths, that I've crossed paths with, has a longing to be a positive uh, presence on this planet, no matter where they come from. And that may have had something to do with our interactions, but it's also what I realize is the hallmark of all the young people. And at some point, I, I really got it that I was not at risk. <laughs> My children were not at, at the same kind of risk that they had once been, and that a whole different kind of young people were starting to come towards me. And it's just been an organic evolutionary process. And now, because I'm so really ready to formally pass the uh, tools of transformation and the consciousness and the ethics and the subtle medicine that comes through this work on to the next generation, really the people that are coming are the ones who are going back to their communities and finding meaningful ways to infuse what they're doing with some of these ways of being um, with themselves, with one another, and with their whole community. And, you know, I have people who've been with in this work with me for like decades who have taken it and shape-shifted it a thousand different ways and are out there doing such beautiful work. And, and this winter, I had the privilege of working with a group of Hutu and Tutsi young refugees who are building a peace movement. And I had like an hour or two with a handful of these young leaders and they're back already in their schools bringing these tools of transformation to the children. So, you know, I don't get to decide how it moves, but if there's a true hunger, I'm there. And if there's a resonance, hallelujah. Well, I, I appreciate that, but there must be something in terms of your own personal preference, even if it's, if it's legacy oriented or yeah. impact oriented or something that... Well, there certainly is something at this point in terms of impact and legacy, of course. But I also want to say even the most bright and sometimes privileged, sometimes not, young people who come, the diverse leaders, they all have got their own risk. I mean, some of the most powerful change agent young leaders that, have, that you saw this week that I work with have stories that are so complicated, so, so potentially tragic, but something in them longs to turn it into gold. And those, are, those people really attract me. And the ones that have the humility and the call and the dedication to be disciplined with themselves, whether it's because they have so much pain or because they understand the world is asking that of them, those are the ones I really want to work with, the ones that are going to take this seriously and, do some, and bring it to the world in a meaningful way. And I actually work with people who work one-on-one -on -one and may never travel outside of the continental, uh, out of, outside of North America. And I work with ones that are going to go all over the globe or who are building peace villages in the Middle East or, or working in inner cities or townships in, in South, you know, all over the place. So I don't have a big preference. There has to be a sincere aspiration, a willingness to be disciplined, and a call and a resonance. That's really it. Okay, so there, there really hasn't been any sort of conscious shifting into more of the, of mentoring tomorrow's international leaders. Well, I will say one more thing. I personally <laughs> have less of an appetite for being called on around the clock. This is part of just the natural evolution of a community and a lineage. My, the young people who started off with me in their teens or even younger or their early 20s, They've got the vim and vigor to like do the around the clock thing. I'm not as fascinated with that. And um, sure I do it, but not not with like, oh, I'll go there. It's called and eldership. It's, well, I'm, I'm not there yet, but it's <laughs> definitely oldership. Yeah. And so that does begin to differentiate uh, who comes. And um, 
yes, at this point, I would say it's important to me that there is a, a conscious reciprocity in the conversation. And yet, I'll carry kids away until they're ready to find their feet and stand on them. If I see something in them that says, this is where I belong, and, I, and, and we all feel it. So, so, but there's nothing consciously or even unconsciously in your thinking about trying to deepen the impact and accelerate social change on the planet by working with these people. <laughs> so, yes, there is, Frederick. I would like to help um, deepen the impact and accelerate social change, of course. And um, I meet what comes, comes towards me. And... I am naturally more attracted. I am naturally more inclined to offer if this young person or this um, community actually longs for what we've got and has an intention to do something with it in their communities, their local or their national or their international communities. Absolutely. Okay, yeah, great. Because, I mean, to me, you know, that, that's just one of the many things that sort of sets you apart from many of your colleagues, you know, doing uh, rites of passage work is your, your interest, at least your seeming interest in, in working with tomorrow's leaders, as it were. Uh, well, hang on just a second. I want to, can we turn up the volume of my headset? Because I, I'm, because you're getting like really strong levels, right? Yeah, it's not really strong, but yeah. strong. Okay, well, I mean, can you, if you can turn it up a little and get even stronger yeah, than Zoo. <coughs> because I want it to be as you know as full as possible. Okay, I can definitely do that. But uh, I thought that there was a volume switch for my headset, but I don't remember where it is. Well, that's okay. You know, <coughs> Frederick, I don't think we can take anybody any place that we are not. So, the people who are coming to me are helping me grow as a leader enormously, and I feel that is my natural place. Way back in the day, when I was really early in my studies with Gabrielle, she used to throw a word out at people, and they'd have to stand up and speak about it. The, you know, and it would be crazy words, like abortion or whatever. The only word she ever threw at me was the word leader. And that was a long time ago. So it is, it is part of this soul's stream, and people who are attracted to this work have some resonance and are called into leadership in and and that's partially because that's what I carry and it's not because I although I did go to school to learn about leadership but I was engaged in that way before that you know for the entire course of my life really or certainly once puberty hit I was always working with groups of people um, I went to a summer camp and I was the captain of 75 girls and we lost every possible game, but we had more spirit than anybody. And I, you know, I was given this big award as the spirit of the camp because I just, it's just natural. It's just something about finding ways to build community feels, is just something I care very deeply about. And, and um, across divides that are um, inside and out and in the spaces between us, it's, really it's where I get to grow and I'm blessed to have young people and olders and some elders who want to engage in those really hard conversations too and we're finding our way and the beautiful thing about this particular body of work is that when one unwinds the ancestral traumas at the level of um, the body then the conversations can begin without all that um, activation and intensity that even with the best verbal communication skills on deck sometimes those conversations are hard to have but when people actually discharge all of that to some degree a certain kind of meeting that can happen a certain kind of meeting can happen that breeds intimacy that be, breeds collaboration uh, and creativity at extraordinary levels and that is exciting to me. You know, um, while we're on the subject of uniquenesses about your work, you know, there's three or four that I'd like to hear you comment on. I mean, <clears throat> you know, one is being body-based, you know, somatic 
work. And I, I don't, you know, well, I, anyway, should we take them one at a time or should I tell you all of the ones that I'm thinking about? I don't care. Whatever you, I, 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 ultimately I'll answer them one at a time. Okay, yeah. So but you just, could give me the list if you want. Well, uh, that's one. And I, I find it, you know, rather unique and remarkable. And the second is uh, mixing the genders. Because, as you know, historically, you know, most indigenous yep. people always kept them separate. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about, and, and even in contemporary workshops, yep. most of them do. And then the third is uh, multicultural. Mm -hmm. You know, that you so freely mix in all of these different cultures. So, <laughs> you know, at one level, it's hard enough to initiate young people, period. But when you layer in all of those other challenges that you're taking on, I mean... You're, you're hitting about a 9.9 .9 on the difficulty meter. <laughs> okay, so why body-based? Why body-based rites of passage? I um, have an elder in my life who said, all rites of passage are body-based. And I was like, yes, it's true. You can't go into nature and go through, you know, the many moments of terror and death and return and be disconnected from your body, obviously. So in that way, absolutely. However, what's really different about this is that rather than going on to the land, this is the land. This is the sacred soil into which we dive very deeply to uh, deconstruct the false senses of self and access the vast intelligence that's coded in our DNA, that's, uh, that's available through our blood and our tissues and our cells. And um, so many of the young people I ca that came into my life, starting with myself, didn't feel a sense of connection with the land necessarily or a place didn't feel a connection with a clan and um, we're looking for home and um, this became the doorway to that to both the most personal and um, that connects you with race and culture and religion but also a very transpersonal space that in that allows us to feel the unification, the unity of all humans, because my tears are not different than your tears. And these kids get that. They get that they have different ways, different things that have made them extremely angry in their lives. But ultimately, that God-given energy that's here to catalyze change is the same thing. Their heartbeat is not different from each other. So the body has just become this incredible, I call it the sacred ceremonial dance ground, you know, where um, the descent and the return all can happen. And it can happen in an inner city and it can happen in the wilderness. And the irony for me is some of the real violation that happened for me as a child happened for me in nature when I was not being protected by other people. And uh, so for me, being in nature became a very dangerous place for me, although I've spent years living, you know, in the mountains and without running water and all that stuff. But actually, I was safer in an inner city where I grew up in a dance studio with all kinds of strong emotions going on because at least we were, there was, there was visibility. At least I was not alone there. At least someone could find us. And so it was just natural for me to want to come off the mountain, literally. And I remember that moment when I made that decision that I wasn't going to live this very alternate lifestyle. I was going to come in and meet the people where the people were and find a way to create these doorways where um, and, and access to something beautiful and sacred um, in some of the places that are, are some of the outwardly ugliest on the planet, you know? Um, you know, so, so why the body... Um, also, and above all, it's where my healing has happened. It's what my primary language is. It's where I could speak to people from different parts of the world. Ironically, I have a really difficult time learning language. I had, a, I had significant hearing loss on both my ears through much of my childhood. 
and I was around enough addiction that I was always studying what's the truth, what's really going on here, because words, one, I couldn't hear them, and two, they didn't have a lot of meaning to me because there was always a disconnect between what people were saying and doing. And so I was always studying what was really going on, and I had so much rage and so much terror in my system that I had to find a way home starting right here. And it's not like, wow, that project's done. However, I have a lot of, I have a really beautiful amount of healing that has occurred here and continues to. So um, that gives you a little bit of why the body. And um, I also feel that the body is also a doorway to incredible pleasure, which is one of the ways that we actually heal. The natural world can give that to us too. The ways that we can soften into her soils, lean against her trees, be bathed in her sunlight, and um, and swim in the you know the warm waters. All of that can help really nourish and replenish and repair a body, um, and that's really important for us. Our capacity to actually learn and think and connect. So. Yeah, that's, I mean, you're dead on right, you know, that every transformation requires some somatic transformation. I mean, it can't happen otherwise. No, it really and, can't. And you're, to my knowledge, you know, one of the few people that are, you know, attacking it at that point, rather than through some ancillary means, you know what I mean? I mean, you know, with, with our men's work, I mean, we really have to basically almost physically pummel guys to get them into their bodies and out of their heads, you know, and your and the dance work that you do does it, you know, so uh, creatively and efficiently too. Well, I want to honor my incredible teachers. I've had so many extraordinary teachers who've given me tools through the body for transformation, and you know the lineage of Gabrielle Roth and and her whole generation has. Of, of you know Emily Conrad and Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen and Anna Halperin these people each were pioneers bushwhacking and opening up the pathway for an entire generation and now a number of generations to utilize the body as a doorway to consciousness and really the mother who was one of my first deepest inspirations, the mother who worked closely with Sri Aurobindo and in the founding of Oroville, that's where the seed happened for me that the body is the place of great transformation. So I've been schooled well and, um, and I have bec I've, I've been a good student of, of, my, of these lineages and of uh, the teachings that have come before me. And I just want to say that and this is, leads to a question of a f the feminine way. I think we learned years ago that heavy cathartic work actually often recapitulates wound and causes people to leave rather than to begin this sacred and essential journey of coming back into connection with their bodies, into connection with themselves. And so I, I do work in a very feminine way. And um, there comes a point when I really call on that part of me that is also strongly masculine, has a lot to do with how I hold the container of the work, especially at the beginning when we're trying to create uh, some, some safety. But um, by design, it's a very gentle path of entry. There's, uh, it just creates a certain kind of safety that allows some of that early developmental repair to happen. And a big chunk of our work is not just initiation and mentoring, it really starts with repair and education. And then an initiation, if the climate is right, if the person is ready, if there is all the right elements, and out of that mentoring. And often the mentoring goes for a long time before there really is an initiatory experience. And you know, yes, what happens in the room is could be called initiation, but there are many I, I humbly work in a way we do where we know the initiation can show up in a variety of different ways, not just what we're actually doing in the room. You know, we've had young people with pregnancies and uh, people who have had 
massive deaths right on the other side of the camp and or the the rites of passage and that's where the initiation actually happens how they show up and meet that or or, or a number of things like that um, unplanned pregnancies thanks for that question Frederick I really love talking about that and um, I also want to say that so much of the wonderful somatic work that's happening out there is not necessarily rites of passage. Just as um, some of the things we call rites of passage, um, well, I, I'll just leave it at that, that, that just because it's a transformational experience does not necessarily mean it's had an initiatory component or that there's the proper supports for the incorporation. And, um, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, that's funny because I just flashed on Wilhelm Reich's work. And he was really good at getting people into their bodies, you know, and having these profound experiences. But it, there was no context whatsoever for yeah. initiation or anything right, like it. Right, right. Uh, well, okay. Well, uh, gender? Should we yeah, get let's a talk about gender. Okay. Yeah. So, Frederick, you asked me, how can we be doing this work with um, the full spectrum of identity and gender and sexual preference in one room? It is complicated. And I want to say that what we do, whether it's a five-week rites of passage process or a two-week or a year-long or even a one-week process, it's not the end of the conversation. For many, it's just the beginning. And I am a strong advocate for um, single, for uh, people who identify in different ways to have affinity groups, be it um, people exploring issues around queer and sexual identity, people, how do I, okay, cut. Can we just talk about this for a minute before I go? Uh, sure, but, uh, but I mean, we could just not use anything yeah, I just want to. I want to really get my language right on this. Sure. Yeah. Men, men or those who identify as men, women or those who identify as women. That includes the transgender spectrum, if that's what you're. Transgender for. spectrum. That's what I'm looking for. That's okay. the word. Okay. And not to mention, obviously, gays and lesbians as well. Well, isn't that the yeah? That's the that's queer. Yeah. That's the queer. Community. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just going to say the queer community. LGBT community. The queer. Yeah, I just yeah. usually say LGBT. Q. I know. L G. I I B it's so T funny. Q. No, I know. My daughter is in this world and it's just such a place. Am I on tape? It's all yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. But you promised me this isn't I'm not it. I don't care to yeah. 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 Okay, so I have such um we're always learning and as a community we're really learning how to create safe spaces for people who identify in any number of different ways to be able to explore their um, preferences and really the whole spectrum and then people who identify outside of a spectrum. So um, we do have men's communities and we do have women's communities and there are groups of people who identify as queer who are gathering and we have had summers where we've had young people who are born into female bodies but are, are on a, uh, identifying more with the masculine at that time sitting in in the men's groups and the opposite and people who are in somewhere along the transgender spectrum really being able to move between these groups and it's um, really important that people can explore the changes happening in their bodies and the unique natures of their hearts as they are moving into more intimacy with themselves, one another, and the world. And there's education that needs to happen there. We do really strong work around, you know, what is a sperm and what is an egg and how do they come together and not only what's literally happening, but what are the spiritual implications of all of this? And we create room for young people's questions, the really, really hard ones around, you know, uh, am I a hoochie mama because I want to show my body to the world? And how can I be a changing body and not just all of a sudden be whistled at? And what if I really want to sleep with boys, but it's not okay in my home? And, you know, just the full range of, of questions get spoken into the room. And so we hold this as 
a moment where the conversation can open in spacious, respectful ways, and we're always learning what that means, how to do that better and better. But we're also saying, and this is just the beginning of a lifelong exploration. And these are your sacred questions. And who are the people that can help you learn and discover some of the answers to these questions? And sometimes that's about turning uh, young people on to, like I said, women, uh, into women's groups, or into courses of study, or it, onto books, or to mentors who might have actually addressed some of these issues themselves. So um, we have found that having a place where the conversation between the genders and bet with people who have multiple identities f brings, sets a social norm that is so powerful as young people grow up and become adults and continue to live their lives together. And we have a number of different ways in which we host those conversations. But basically, we're taking the lid off of that room at a place in our maps that people are really developmentally ready for those kinds of conversations. Because I feel our societies abduct young people, whether it's through imagery, literally through physical invasion, through conversation, through expectation that young people are not allowed to actually access their connection to their bodies and their golden hearts and their creativity and their fer fertility um, before they actually go into their exploration of their sexuality. So in our work, when everybody's in the room, we, we lay these in in a very specific way, um, the teachings around this so that when we get to the conversation around sexuality, we actually know something about how to have healthy dialogue with each other. We actually know something about, this, this is how it feels to be me, and it's okay to have, say yes, yes, or no thank you. And then, like I started off saying, we invite people to go into affinity groups 12 months of the year, throughout the whole course of their lives. And um, that's just, um, part of these practices that we share in this rites of passage experience, uh, setting social norms that can become ways of life. And I do think that there are certain conversations that cannot happen with us all in the room and must. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, to me because, um, you know, the simplest and I, I'm sorry, I gotta, I can hardly see anymore. It's gotta, good. I Come on. Put, let's, can I have a sip here too? Can sure. we sip it up? Yeah. Um, you can just keep rolling, it doesn't matter, because I'll just roll out this thought for a moment. I mean, uh, you know, one of the things that I like about the, the mixed gender aspect, although it does have downsides to me too, but uh, is that, <clears throat> you know, we, we live in a, in a kind of you could maybe a post-feminist time uh, where, you know, the, the distinctions between the genders are so fluid. And, you know, if we're really going to inhabit uh, the world that we all want it to be, of, you know, true equality between the genders, then maybe it demands a kind of forward-thinking initiatory process where both of them are brought together. That's beautiful, Frederick, and I really appreciate you speaking to that. There's two more things I want to say about this whole question of why bring people who identify in any number of different ways into the room together. Um, one is, I think, a hallmark of the people who come towards me and our community at this point is that they are shapeshifters. They are capable. They are um, aspiring, whether consciously or not, to walk between the worlds. and. Um, between many different worlds. The worlds of gender is part of that. And I, I really come from lineages where my teachers were really able to show up in many different ways and bring forward intense masculine and wide open feminine energies and play in a realm that's none of the above. And, and I think that's part of being a certain kind of medicine person on the planet and always has been, actually. And um, I see that in, in those who are showing up in the room. And so that's part of it. It's just the mirroring of that amongst ourselves and the uh, ins insemination of that consciousness between us 
just by being together. The other thing is I have worked for years and years and years and years with young women, maidens, and I for sure don't have the boys in the room. And I really am mentoring incredible young leaders to work with the young, the boys just as puberty is coming on and the girls just as their menses is coming on and really to hold those as very separate. And I think that's the coming of age work, which is very different and handled in a very different way than um, the more initiative, initiatory work that happens later in adolescence as we are really crossing into the terrain of adulthood. There's a deep welcoming onto the journey of he, she, they who is changing. And that's beautiful, gentle, educational work. And, um, and so I'd also like, did you want to say something Yeah, else? I just want to say one more thing. And, and part of how I was taught by one of my great mentors, Tamara Slayton, and inspired to work with this age is through beauty is to not just technologic to create to teach in a technological way or in a scientific way this is what's happening to your body but to really bring it through through images of beauty and to invite these young people to consider the mystery and the majesty of the fact that their bodies are changing. It's not just like, how do I get this blood and regulate it and wrap it up and hide it away? But how do I come to know the fact that I am fertile and I can create life and I have so much choice about what I get to create in this life? Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, and you're, you're not just doing either or, right? You're getting gradations in between as well, yes? Well, yeah, oh yeah, I have like four gradations. Yeah. yeah. Oh, in terms of frame size. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Well, then let's talk about the multicultural aspect of okay. it, too, because, again, <laughs> I mean, you sure know how to open cans of worms, and uh, that's a big one, too. Yeah. So, it, the bottom line is I'm just being true to my own soul. That's all I can do, is just be authentically who I am evermore. And I grew up with diversity. I grew up being um, the token Jew in a certain school environment, surrounded by African-American young people who I had total and complete resonance with and hung with, um, with a father who was raised in Mexico and spoke many languages, um, playing on the border of Mexico and Texas as a child. Um, living in close proximity with people of many different religions. It's just, and I grew up in a city. I actually grew up around a lot of diversity. And I also somewhat had religious upbringing, but it meant very little to me. What meant something to me was some of the, some of the religious ceremonies I saw going on around me. They attracted me. And I would get myself around them whenever I could. <laughs> um, I had a woman who was part of my family who was very Catholic, and I would go pray with her. You know, I never told anybody I was doing this, but off I would go. And it, it, it satisfied a deep hunger in my being. And, um, you know, and I was a little deadhead. You know, I didn't care how I got to this experience of something bigger than myself. So... Um, I was never okay with the inequities I saw going on around me. I, I was never okay with seeing somebody put, hurt another person or disregard them. And it, it, you know, it hurt my personhood in a very deep way from a very early age. And I would like do things about it, you know, and I was always kind of an advocate for the underdog. And you know, I would take my 25 cents allowance and I would make sure that as I was following behind my parents, I was giving it to somebody, when, especially when we spent our winters on the border. So um, with that said, this is going to sound pretty funny, but I'm just going to tell you this story. My grandmother 
would always, I just put this together yesterday. Well, there's two things. My grandmother on my mother's side crocheted me this beautiful little picture that was above my bed my entire childhood. And it was of the old woman in the shoe who had so many children she did not know what to do. And it was, and I would look at it you know, for a decade and a half above my bed. And I'm sure it had some kind of subliminal messaging for me. Plus she brought me dolls from around the world. And I didn't really want toys. I just had my dolls. And I just would study their costumes and how they looked and everything about them. And I just, I learned about the world through those dolls. And then I had the good fortune of once going to, uh, I guess Disneyland, and I went through Small World, Small World. And as far as I can tell, that was my first ecstatic experience. I was out of my mind to see people to the same music, all dancing from many parts around the world. And it took me till like my 40s to put all this together, but to realize that imprinted me so deeply. And, um, you know, it's like, My soul has just been revealing itself to me organically over time. It's not like I had this idea. It's just been what's natural. So there I was at 21 years old in a village of Kodakarai in South India doing this work, having this epiphany about the children of the world are calling. And then I was living in New Mexico as a single mom saying, who's going to help me raise this child? Feeling totally alone. And I saw all these kids doing drugs in a back alley and I just sort of this voice said to me you're going to raise the children and going to help you raise the children you know and these were like lightning bolts messages coming to me and before I knew it someone was contacting me from this same part of South India saying we've got two young people we'd love to send to your camp and it turns out they're from the same village and now they're in their 20s and you know spirit conspired to get all these people and the way this has organically unfolded is so much bigger than any cool ideas of mine truly and then the reality of it all is here which is okay so there's issues of race there's issues of class there's issues of of cultural and cultural appropriation there's issues of uh diverse religions you know and well it's friday night and Certain people want to have a Sabbath, but we dance on Saturdays, and other people want to have a Sabbath on Sundays. And we've just hung in there for these conversations. And I'm grateful to have these conversations and sit in the tension of it and discover answers that don't in any way um, whitewash the needs of the individual streams, cultures, races that are coming in the room and that cause us all to grow and really consider what it means to be on the planet together in a respectful way. I also know that there's a deep hunger with the people who somehow end up in our rooms, although they might be feisty and they might challenge, and and that happens a lot. There is a um, longing to find that thread that actually also unites us and unifies us because um, us and them is going gonna, is gonna to cause us to have big problems. And I think we all now know that the environment is leveling the playing field anyway, you know. So in the end, and I really, this really became clear with the kids from the Middle East, you know, the Palestinians, the Jordanians, and the Israelis would come in. It's like, I'm not going to live in the same house as those people. And I said, actually, you have one second here. I also really have to go to the bathroom, but I dare not move. Well, uh, if you, can you hold it a while? Or? I can hold it a while. I sometimes hold it all morning okay. in the dance. Okay, um, let me just say one thing. Okay. So our community and our work is a living laboratory for really the evolution of consciousness. and. Um, my time in Oroville at 21 made a big imprint on me about um, creating environments where these uh, conversations and these complex dynamics that are all over the planet can be explored. And um, just recently I sat with a group of young people who really have formed what we're calling the diversity 
committee, the uh, diversity team, to support an even more conscious unfolding of how we respect the many different uh, ways, diverse ways of praying, the diverse ways of, of uh, well, prayer is a big one, but even the diverse music, the diverse food, so that everybody has a sense of, one, sitting at the table and having a say in how things unfold moving forward into the future, but also feel that there's um, equitable comfort and familiarity. I mean, I'm not create, we're not creating rites of passage that's all about comfort, but you know, just to have one kind of food versus another kind of food is actually, um, you know, it promotes exclusivity, and we're, we're looking at it at, at every level. And um, I have a, so many of these young people who, like I said, came as teenagers, are now adults and care very much and love this work and are really here to help grow it so that it can meet the needs of many, many diverse communities. And, and honestly, it is rolling out in many places around the world in ways I can't even know of. I mean, I know one young woman who <laughs> sent us a video of herself doing a little version of all this with a gun as she was doing military duty on the border in Israel. You know, I mean, that's an example. I know that some of our leaders are doing work in the villages in South India, helping really uh, revitalize their indigenous arts, but infusing their approach to that um, with tools, with practices that they learned here. So there's so many ways this is um, it, honoring diversity and simultaneously um, there's some hallmarks to the practices and to the ethics and to the ways that we work as a community here. Well, you, you sort of t answered it, but I, I still want to ask this question. So what do you say to somebody who says, well, you know, an African-American okay. person yeah. needs an, an African-centric initiation and, uh, you know, a, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I've had those conversations many times that um, people who come from traditional cultures and communities where they have rites of passage that really um, infuse a young person with the traditional ways of their people, I am 100% supportive and encouraging and advocating for those rites of passage experiences to happen. And to me, this is complementary and not exclusive and quite honestly, this without that, it has some limitations. And um, I really encourage people to understand where their people come from and what are the ways of their own traditions so that they can be incorporating that into how they live their lives and what they stand up for in this life. Absolutely. Yeah, great. Um, you know, Surfing the creative, you, you sort of touched on this earlier, but I want to name it. I mean, it actually does have more of a feminine energy to me. And, and, and I'll tell you why. I mean, well, first of all, the dancing itself, and, and this, is, this is not a universal, this is a, a very relative time-based judgment, but the culture connotes, our dominant culture connotes dancing with more feminine energy these days. I'm not saying that's how it should be, et cetera, I, and I love dancing, but that's one thing. A second is that you absolutely have men on staff, but you're a woman leader, and, and the leader team is predominantly women, or at least they outnumber the men. And then also a third thing is that the, the, the initiates themselves, the ratio of girls to boys is roughly two to one, or at least it was in this last week. So. Um, so I, I'm just curious how you would, how you would address that. I'm so glad you asked the question about feminine leadership and the masculine in this work, Frederick. Thank you. So this work began like so many rites of passage communities began in these contemporary times out of uh, parents' need for something for their children that wasn't happening. And I really joined together with other single moms, you know, it's just who showed up, who felt incredible gaps in their children's development. 
And it was ridiculous for years. It was like single moms and we just support each other and we would be creative with our kids. And my first summer camp, which was called Small World Dancers, it was for little children. I've worked throughout the life cycle very, very deeply. And then I worked with pregnant women. And then all of a sudden I felt confident to like work with the pregnant women and their husbands and postpartum the whole family. And it's just been an organic process of my own transformation and the work's transformation um, that has made it possible for the men to want to come in the room, to feel confident that they'll have a voice in the room, and to be ready to come into the room. It's just been a process. And we are really at a place now where I'm so excited about this next generation because quite honestly, in terms of powerful leadership, not necessarily uh, somatic therapists, but in terms of powerful leadership, there's equally as many men, if not even more so than, than young women. So I feel like it's just an organic process and um, we are moving towards a collaborative leadership process that feels very um, much embracing the spectrum of gender and gender identity and all of that. Um, and yes, it started off as a single mom with kids and kids and kids who had no parents and kids who had didn't know their dads or, or a dad who wanted to come help and yay. And, you know, we just have been building it by who shows up. And um, there were years, I mean years, that I was wailing for more masculine collaboration and support. And, um, and I still weep at times about the gaps that so many young people have not with, uh, because of absent parents, parents who passed away or parents who can't show up. And... Um, I'm so grateful for the work that happens in our community that supports more and more men feeling ready and confident to come in here and work with us because we really need you guys. We really need you guys. And it's sweeter for everybody and it's more effective. And I, I just also want to say that um, In the dance world, I think we have more men than many, many of other conscious dance scenes. And I have some really potent colleagues that are really helping to build the men's work in this community. And it's slowly happening. And it's been a deficit, Frederick. It's been a deficit. Do you have to bend over backwards to try to recruit more men to be no. initiates or to come through the work? Or? No, not at all. No. But the ratio, uh, I assume, has never been much different. Uh, uh, than there have been a now. few years it's felt closer to 50%. There really have been a few years it's been like that. Um, so it just depends. You know, it all started with one young man at 14 years old who came in. You know, we joke about it totally. He had the bravery, the call, and he showed up. And then there was one older man who showed up. And, you know, that's how it started. And, you know, and that's just how it started. And then a mighty river comes behind that. You know, I, I have a related comment, and it's not even a question, but I, I, I'm going to say the comment, and you can respond as you see fit. I mean, you know, I got to say... You know, on that first day, that first Sunday, you know, at the Avalon Ballroom, and I'm seeing all of these uh, people, but I'm, I'm noticing the women in the room, and I'm noticing all of these beautiful young women dancing, by my standards, half naked. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, oh my God. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what are these young men thinking, you know, who are gonna be going on this journey with these young women? And it, and it cracked me up because on day three, you said in the morning something to the effect of, and you might have started to feel attraction toward the opposite <laughs> gender. And I, I think it started, <laughs> and I, I'm laughing, you know. And I, and I, so that's anyway, that's just my comment. Well, that's so great. I'm glad you're bringing that up. I have to say, you have not met. Our community has a team of elder men 
that are fierce protectors of the dance space. And they carried this community through the whole generation of leaders you just met and all their escapades on the dance floor and off the dance floor with each other. And they were not in the room necessarily with this particular rites of passage, but there's a team of noble uh, kings who have, have called their brothers out on, out on behavior, who have helped women who have a history of opening faster than is maybe good for them and get on the dance floor and self-exploit. They've really been helpful in building some, again, social norms that are healthy, that allow people to heal, because I'm really inviting them to open wide, but not because I want them to have an experience of perpetration again, you know, and it's not just towards the women. So there are some older elders who are, you know, got their eye on that and have had to work it inside of themselves first and have actually. And this next generation has that in their, in their makeup now because one, they've seen the impacts of their own exploits and adventures and two, because they really get the work and they want to protect their younger sisters and brothers. So I felt, I mean, some of the wildest ones, the ones who were absolutely out of control in their teen years and in their young adult lives, were the ones who were like, we got to we got to leave the dance floor because there's two people missing it and we're sure they're sleeping together. And, you know, they were all over it. I'm like, I can't believe it's you who's really concerned about this. So we have some real health here and some some awareness of all this. And and I'm not into shaming anybody. Of course, we're attracted to each other and learning how to work with that energy is part of part of this path actually and i have been tested throughout the course of my life as has pretty much every one of us yeah no i i appreciate that and especially the last part of that answer about learning how to work with those energies is really essential and naming that you know because i i certainly appreciate you know the container holding aspect of it i mean i uh you know i i certainly uh, am there a hundred percent with you and i you know, I, I, I felt like not only in, in with myself, but with other men, you know, it's like I want to be on top of protecting the sacredness of this space. And it's like, oh, my God, what a fucking distraction. <laughs> it's like, Jesus. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I want to be initiated, but I mean, I'm walking around like a, a dog, you know, with his <laughs> tongue hanging out of his mouth. You know what I mean? And I, I, to be honest, I'm looking forward to talking with Miguel about that a little yeah. bit. You know, what was his experience of that? Because my guess is that was quite a different cultural experience for him, too, vis-a-vis -vis young women. Uh, you don't see women walk around East Oakland like that very often. Well, Frederick, we've had some really cultural complexities around that, you know, where young, Amer uh, you know, young white boys just strutting all their stuff and, and young women from South India who actually have never had a viewing of their own bodies. And we've spent time in that room really wrestling with that and talking about that. And how can we create a baseline that allows everybody to be in the room in a way that respects their culture? And, you know, we definitely had to, we didn't go deeply into the conversation this particular ride, but we invited a certain uh, group of the men to actually wear shirts because it was culturally inappropriate for some other people. And we're not about that. Um, the other thing is the dance itself is the medicine to help us work and channel and open all that energy and ground it. And um, personally, it's like another thing that catalyzes more um, expansion in the body. And if you're aroused, that can become fully sexual or can become connected as sacred, creative, God-given energy that we want to make a conscious choice about how we channel onto the planet. And so, you know, bring it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I, I mean, I, it's entirely possible that you said those very words more and uh, often than I actually heard them, or maybe I was out of the room or something, but I think that's a point that really needs to be said and said and said again. Thank you. Yeah. Feedback received. Great. Yeah. Thanks, Frederick. Yeah. Um, so, 
uh, let's shift gears a little bit and just talk about your organizational structure and, you know, <laughs> the challenges that are there and, you know, in particular funding. I yeah, mean, yeah. Well, you know, this started off as like a summer camp in my backyard, literally. And then it grew to weekly dance classes and then it grew to community events and then it grew to seasonal events. We've done seasonal events for years and then it grew to smaller rites of passage events for birth and death in particular or with smaller groups of individuals who were coming of age or moving into young adulthood. And um, there's been a very organic growth here and um, again it was like it started off in my basement and we've just had to grow up actually organizationally we've had to figure out legalities with the state of Colorado and then we're working with kids from all over the planet and the r laws when I go teach in New Zealand are totally different and you know all of that and we've had to shift everybody's expectation about what was once just a community offering now has become more cumbersome than all of that and yet how many parents either can afford to or want to pay for their child to have a rite of passage experience with some strange group of people in, in this town, you know? And of course, it, it has saved many families thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars of psychotherapy, if that's how that family uh, rolls. Um, it's kept people, brought people back to, to, this work has allowed people to really move out of addictive behaviors and substance use and abuse and many young people have uh, changed their relationship with medication or even worked with some of the dynamics around incarceration and gotten on with their lives so it has been it, it would be a good investment for many families but most families don't see that and part of our job is going to be to be communicating about that to tell that story so that rites of passage in general and this work in particular um, connected with the whole field has has a different kind of credibility however um, I also believe that it's every young person's right who sincerely wants this and we recently had a situation where a young person was didn't fully enlist themselves and they weren't up for the ride and they didn't really go on this journey in the same way so I'm really about young people making this choice for themselves what we've learned is um, they're happy to invest in it once they have a sense of what it is and that could be ten dollars just some investment or their time and lots and lots of young people and their parents or somebody in their community invests time but the truth is this work is underfunded around the planet not just right here in Boulder Colorado and I lived with a lot of confusion and and even anger you know it's like come on people we are raising up your kids and no one's no one's showing up to help back us like could somebody pick them up at the airport at least and and I came to realize that part of why these kids are hurting is because no one's picking them up at the airport <laughs> and that what we're gonna do is figure out how to give these young people what it, their birthright actually which is a experience of being potently and consistently supported along with being um, invited and at times uh, n what's the word um, invited and what's this word I'm looking for? not uh, oh well inviting young people to um, en and encourage and nudge that's the word I was looking for inviting young people nudging young people to keep moving forward with their lives so um, that we were gonna we were gonna provide that and we were gonna do whatever we could to make that possible for young people that there could be a place where sanity where safety where their dignity where sanity and safety could happen for them so that their true dignity could be ignited and remembered actually a lot of just remembering so one of the ways that it occurred to me to work with this community and, and gather resources from this community, this local one, was to have these Sunday morning dances where we don't charge a lot of money, but actually those dances um, fund many years a third of our rites of passage process, 
which is a sweet way for individuals to consistently, you know, tithe and put money into the basket. And that, that, that's wonderful because then everybody feels a little bit invested in this next group of, of young people coming through Surfing the Creative. I have also, you know, gone and sat with parents and said, what are we going to do here? How can we work together to make this experience possible for your child? And had some hard conversations with adults um, who, who... So I've sat with adults and, and parents and had some of these hard conversations with people who seem to me um, are able to contribute to their child's experience, even if they've been estranged from their children. And I've had those conversations on the front end with parents, and I've had them on the back end of our rites of passage uh, journeys with the parents and the children, how to move forward. And so I've, I've sat in those hot seats. And then we've done really conventional fundraising that hasn't proved to be terribly successful because we're not just a, a program focused on a um, specific population in a six week easily understood process. Uh, this whole thing is sort of outside the box and a little unwieldy and people were like, you know, we can't really help with that. That's not something we can put in our funding package for this year. But there are foundations that have supported us absolutely and do consistently. There are individuals who have come to understand what we do and just it's what they do every year they contribute a certain amount of money and um, you know some years we have more money than other years and we're looking at a three-year plan and working with the whole next generation of leaders looking at we have this amount of money what do we want to do so it's no longer really about me and it's no longer really about even the administrative team or board of directors. It's actually around this community that has now taken full responsibility for the expression of this beautiful work. But now I'm inviting them to join me in taking full responsibility for the sustenance of this beautiful work. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to move from a whole different kind of organizational, from what was really one woman's vision and the founder and all that stuff to a more collaborative uh, responsibility and leadership and directorship of this of this golden bridge. And we, we've given ourselves three years to go through that transition. And um, to actually have a paid executive director and relieve you of some of those duties too? or Say that again? To have a paid executive director and relieve you of some of those duties too? Is that I'm not sure it? exactly how it's all going to go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going to be decided. But I have other things that are calling me, as you know. And it's not walking away from this, but it's more about training people. And it's also about doing this work and really seeing it ignited in other places around the world that also need these simple practices for healing and awakening and yeah. bridging. Yeah. Um, are, well, if you're open to it, I'd love to hear what your budget is. I, you know, I don't want to get into that. Okay, but that I'll doesn't. tell you why I, I'm, I'm curious because I've never seen uh, uh, a rite of passage that's, perf that's so deeply supported by paid professionals. I mean, where you have two body workers there every day, you have, I don't know how many paid therapists mm -hmm. on staff. I mean, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. You know, most of my experience in this work is uh, two or three, or, you know, sometimes many more, but not professionals, not paid. Um, so there's Anyway, there, there's something. There's I'm happy to speak about that, and we are. It is our intention to have our books be transparent. That's absolutely an intention of creating a strong, healthy, community-based rites of passage organization, and and um, programming and processes. That's all part of it. So that's absolutely our intention. But I want to say that every single person, with the exception of maybe one, maybe two, grew up in this work. Even the elders they had their own initiation because I've worked for years with adults also not just youth and with women separate very very deep deep work that consistently happens around uh, around the calendar year 
So every single person here, one, loves to come back and go through the journey and have their own reboot, recalibration. Every single person there um, is devoted to this community and to the growth of this work because they understand what it's been for them. And nobody there gets paid, well, I, I, any of the professionals that are out in the world really doing this, they get paid so much less than what they possibly could make on a daily basis. And then, um, you know, there are a number of people in there who are really just out of college and interns who are really um, maybe getting a stipend so that they can take a week off from work and have it work out with paying their rent. But um, that's, okay. yeah. Even that is exceptional is what I'm saying. Because, yeah. you know, in my experience, most people are volunteers all up and down the line. And, um, and in many cases, like our men's work, you know, we'll have a staff of 40 men. Four men are paid a very small stipend. 36 of them pay for the privilege of being there to help initiate other men. I believe that if we'd had a different kind of leadership, we would have done this differently. And it's how we've done it. And this year is the year we're going to reconsider how we're gonna sustain ourselves. And some of this may change because you're absolutely right. There's um, something unsustainable about it. And um, it could breed a climate of entitlement. And just for the record, I don't get paid a penny. I do all of this on volunteer. Well, frankly, that was my assumption. Yeah. And, you know, just to be clear, I mean, most of my sense is that it's actually admirable <laughs> that you pay people. But it does, it, you know, it can get gray areas, you know, when it's, you know, as, as long as their intentions are, are pure and they want to be of service, then it's great uh, to pay them as well. Well, and that, thank you, Frederick, because that's the dignity of that choice which is I really value these human beings and our organization creates an incredible landscape for healing and repair and education and by the way initiation too. So I value the intelligence that comes through each of these people who've now this year more than ever are really seriously competent and able to help hold this with me in extraordinary ways. So absolutely they need to be paid and they should be paid. Um, there, there have been years when there hasn't been that competency, and then it's been a little bit sh uh, sh shakier. Um, I, I, I agree, and I think that people should be funded for showing up and serving community, and especially if we're gonna be doing this year round. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, let's talk about um both how you define a rite of passage, but also whether you share the notion that I do that it's kind of a unifying field theory for youth development, that, that in a sense, it, it, it helps us connect the dots of all of the various youth dysfunctions into one potential solution. Well, I'm gonna answer that first and then I'll define a rite of passage. I feel that rites of passage for youth development um, has the capacity to unify the field of the divergent needs um, with young people coming of age and moving into adulthood. And certainly it's aligned with the positive youth development movement, absolutely. And it is a missing piece in so much of the programming and thinking behind uh, youth development. With that said, there's ways to cheapen something called rites of passage that could end up working against the unifying of the field. And calling every after-school arts program a rites of passage concerns me because it won't do what we're talking about in terms of layering in um, values and um, giving young people vehicles for self-regulation and for identity uh, exploration. So
I feel uh, discerning about how we bring it into a more modern and mainstream consciousness about youth development. And rites of passage without the elements that I speak to very specifically, without repair work, without education, and without mentoring, so that just have the initiatory experience, to me is actually almost irresponsible when coming and working with young people. And I feel that the field of rites of passage, by nature coming together in community and by nature putting, uh, cre creating environments where young people can interact with the natural environment, all that is very repair. It helps young people repair the ways in which they are disconnected from themselves, from their true north, from humanity, their own and, and others. Certainly those things help. But I also think that there is some learning that as a field of rites of passage we have to do um, that will help us strengthen our work in terms of really learning how to repair a nervous system and unwind trauma in the body and um, move from a state of activation into integration. So that feels important to me in our conversation about rites of passage. In terms of the educational piece, which feels, which for us is a second component of our rites of passage uh, journeys, that's critical. And I know, for example, in many different traditional uh, ways of initiating young people, education's intimately woven into everything. Young people are taught the ways of their ancestors, are taught, you know, the ceremonies, are taught how to tend to themselves and their environments, all sorts of things. That feels critical to me. And um, practical uh, tools, need practical skills need to be taught in rites of passage. Uh, processes. It feels really important. You know, how do I navigate once I go out there? I had the sweetest moment with one young man. We were done with surfing the creative and he was getting ready to go home and he and I went upstairs. He'd never put on a washing machine and he learned about stripping his bed and doing the whole thing and it was to me one of my favorite moments of the summer. It's like he just felt so empowered he couldn't wait to go home and tell his mom about I know how to do my own laundry now. And you know, for a lot of these kids, that's not a big deal. But for this young man, that's like a ticket to being a responsible member of his family. And so I'm really interested in, and it can't happen while on the mountain. Some of it can happen. We certainly taught a lot around values, a lot around self-care, a lot about right relationship with each other. But some of these practical things come over time, come with the mentoring, coming with the ongoing education. And then, of course, the mentoring. Um, we can mentor young people who haven't been initiated. We can mentor young people who are walking around the world fragmented. And there's plenty of good mentoring in those situations. But to have given a young person experience where they can unwind the false persona and begin to access their true noble nature and their, their, their brilliance and their calling and mentor from that place, that's extraordinary. And that's where rites of passage and youth development just got to get together and, and uh, learn each other's ways. You know, it's interesting. Um, Angelis Arian gave me probably the simplest definition of uh, a, a rite of passage. Uh, and it's along the lines of what you just said. It's basically she said, skill acquisition and demonstration of mastery of that skill. Beautiful. You know, and it, to my way of thinking, that might be overly simplistic, but nonetheless, I thought it very interesting and useful. Well, do you want me to talk for a minute about rites of passage? Well, because uh, I haven't spoken something that feels really important around all that. All right. Then yeah. Go ahead. To me, a rite of passage is any experience that deconstructs us and causes us to have to meet something bigger than ourselves and find within ourselves resources to um, integrate the experience and return to life in a new way. And birth, the experience of being born and the experience of birthing. Death, the experience of holding a space and returning from the loss of a beloved and death itself, of course. And so many other uh, natural developmental transitions can be powerful rites of passage, as can life crises. Um, 
you know, the sudden death of somebody we love, the flood that just came through our community, the, um, the genocide that I just sat with all these kids who survived. They have had mad life crises, and as a result of it, they have been initiated through rites of passage. And it wasn't a program designed by their community at all. And in fact, I found them to be some of the most integrated, resilient young adults I've met anywhere on the planet, and we can talk about that. So there's just the natural rites of passage experience that is developmentally in you know, part of life, there are the life crises. And then there's the natural cycles of the day, sunrise and sunset, and the four seasons if you're in a climate where there's the turning from one season to the next. And those natural cycles to me also have moments where there is a bit of a right if one is awake to the transition happening. So I, for me, I just, I'm fascinated with all of life cycles actually. Yeah, well, that's and that's actually just FYI, a point that the film is going to make very clear that, in fact, there's six or seven, depending on how you name them, logical rites of passage in a given normal human lifespan. Yeah. And that the focus of our film is just simply one of them, from adolescence to young adulthood. Beautiful. But, but arguably, they're all of equal significance. It's just that, for whatever reason, I find this one most pressing and and needful of, of further uh, uh, discussion. Um, Certainly a lot of need here. Yeah. Uh, let me just check my list here. Check it twice. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I have a lot of sort of things that we sort of touched on, but sort of not. Um, Are you too much in the sun there, Frederick? I'm getting there, but I, I'm also cognizant of time, and we really only have another few minutes left. So What time is it? It's uh, about 7 to 3. Um, locked up. I can't even see my cursor. <laughs> um, you know, so much of, of um, adolescent behavior has been criminalized and has been drugged. You know, we just give them drugs or we throw them in jail or, you know, and that's pretty much our s social solutions to, to adolescent behavior. You know, talk about how um, community responses could be different? Great question. How can um, communities respond differently to young people as they navigate the complex waters of adolescence? Well, my first strong um, feeling about that is that the adults or the people who have spent enough years on the planet to be called adults actually have some work to do with themselves to befriend their own unfinished adolescent business so that they can sit comfortably in the wild, creative, unpredictable energy that is adolescence and that is betwixt and between. So I feel that um, creating environments where um, the adults can really deconstruct their own childhoods, their own biographies, so that they really can consider whether they're living their own true destinies, that feels really important. And for the losses that they have faced to be really grieved and the things that cause them to be angry really understood more deeply for its pure nature. And, and are they living in alignment with that soul that was stirring and rising up into action in their adolescence? Or have they self-medicated? Or have they shut down and sold out? Um, where have we betrayed our own inner adolescence? Or where, how can we get the supports so that we can become ever more comfortable with our own vast creative intelligence inside us? That feels to me like the first bit, bit of business, which means we may have to really investigate our lifestyles and make some choices that ironically will help us pass on to the world and to our children's children um, 
the kind of health environmentally, economically, educationally that we actually say we want to. So that's the first bit of business. And to me, that's not like a one weekend workshop. That's a life path. And I feel if we could understand this energy called adolescence, the chaotic uh, disorganization and reorganization that's happening in that soul birthing and come become safe ground for it to dance with and upon, um, our young people would have more options for what they do with all that energy. And if we could together create more spaces where young people can come and really learn the things that they are longing to learn, um, rather than just these ancient textbooks and sitting at a desk and passing all these tests and going to college and succeeding in a good way or getting a job and, and showing up and being paid minimum wage, if we could actually just even once a week give every young person an opportunity to remember something about this creative intelligence awakening in them, to access it, to express it, to experience it, there would be um, less despair and less destruction. And that means we have to rethink what we do on Saturday nights and how we live our lives so that we actually create room in our day for these young people. And, and what I've learned, and I've sacrificed some things as in my adult life to be able to be present with the young people, but what I learned is that the joy and the uh, even ecstasy that I have with my, with my peers, with my colleagues, when we come together and create safe spaces that are inspiring for young people, that is far better than, than any number of other things I could do on a weekend night that are more traditional or common or, and such. So, um, the, yeah, so that's a bit of my answer to that. Yeah, no, that's great. You, <coughs> actually, I thought of another question. and I don't uh, remember the question. <laughs> what, what, I'm curious, what are the benchmarks that you use to measure a person's uh, passage, you know, through this soul birthing, you know, through the eight days of surfing the creative. How do you know this person's got it? Um, that's something I'm really working on being able to try and uh, share with the next generation of leaders. We just had a young woman come through our surfing the can, creative. Can you name the subject too? That yeah, okay, great. So the question is, um, how do we know when somebody has actually completed their rites of passage and are now standing in their ad adult, authentic, autonomous self? And I actually have mapped a journey from um, through the process that I, I do use to study the development of, a, of my students and and now some of them colleagues into adulthood. But there are these moments that I just want to describe one and then I can share that map or not. We'll talk about that. I ha we just had a young woman come through Surfing the Creative and she's come through before. And she keeps showing up and she keeps doing her work and this time she had a very different experience. She didn't go through it in the traditional way. She actually spent a lot of time outside the room working with some hard material inside herself. And when she finally came back in and joined the group, she was brighter than I'd ever seen her. And she was, a, she was um, very enthusiastic about what happened and continued to show up. And just yesterday in one of our uh, in days where we were doing some work around incorporation and we were talking about diversity issues, all of a sudden this young woman just like, stood up and like a brilliant world change advocate for, for understanding around race, she spoke up about what it was like for her people in the inner city. And she blew the entire room away. And I just looked at her and I looked at everybody. I said, she just stepped onto the leadership team because she knew who she was. She stood in it with so much love she was inclusive of the diverse ways and kind towards the ignorance, but ruthlessly telling her truth in a way that caused everybody to forever remember her message. And um, she was 
with the with um, full potency on her own path. There, nothing in the world could stop this young woman from doing what she came here to do in this life now. And she wasn't asking anybody for permission. And she um, transformed our room just by her very presence. So I watch for those moments. And they can show up in a piece of art. They can show up in a project that happens down the road. That can show up in a hard conversation that a young person finally has with their parents post-camp. That can show up in how they wrestle with me. And I, there have been many, many people who've come through and they just naturally start doing their work and it's easy and it's obvious and they just feel empowered. And, um, you know, I think of one young woman who works in the, in the film and video and she just came, she gathered her tools and her resources. She went and did her own thing. She developed some other parts of her uh, practice as a leader and she's back and in such a dignified way she just sits in her authority and does her work in the community. There are others who push really hard against me who have to and and some of the other adults who have to really question everything that I'm about, try to take me down, uh, you know, who have mother issues or father issues and is there really room for them and you know, am I for real and we have to go through all that stuff and I just hang in with them and it sometimes brings me, it's really painful, it's really intense. And I, once I bring somebody into this community, unless they are violent, which has actually, thank goodness, never happened, um, you know, I'm here for the long haul. I may have to set some big boundaries. So um, last summer I did a teaching where I marked for my most seasoned students what I perceive as the developmental stages um, through this body of work to where they can be standing next to me as colleagues. And the first is for many, and they don't all come in at the beginning, but really we're carrying them on their, our back. And whatever it takes to get them in the room, whatever it takes to get them through this process, we're there with them. You know, there's just a lot of unconditional mothering going on and t helping them find their relationship with their body and that there might be some safety on this planet and, you know, all is well. You can do no wrong. Just keep showing up and we got you. And from there, we move into a place where people can start to stand on their own legs and explore and ask. They're really starting to ask their own questions and having some sense of this is where I come from and I'm... I'm different than you, and I need this, and you know, we're walking side by side, but there's still a pretty strong leaning on me, or the whole leadership team, or their particular person that they've chosen. And I, I really see that as like more of the fathering. So we move from a mothering to a fathering, where we're just uh, still really in, in, in a strong repair around parenting dynamics, and all kinds of things can happen there. And then there is this adolescent developmental process that people go with, through with the authority in this work. And um, it could be also how they are relating to their own parents. They're people who've come through this work for years, but really haven't left home yet. And they're already in their mid-20s. <laughs> and last summer I had a situation where I set up a constellation where there was a man and a woman. They were pretty much their peers. And I asked this young woman to stand, where are you in relationship to your parents? She put herself smack in the middle of them. And I said, and where do you want to go? And um, she took about a half a step out. And I let it sit. And then we did a whole bunch of work the next day. Oh, and there was another young man who started there too. And I said, and where do you want to go? And he stepped way the heck out there. Ironically, he's not even here this summer. He's on his path. So I am... Um, came back to that the very next day and I said to this young woman after we'd done a certain amount of work, here's the constellation, where are you now? And she stepped out quite a bit further. Since that time, this young woman has left her home country. She's engaged to be married. She's changed her career. She's on her path now. But she really um, had to be called out on the fact that she was still hiding at home and it wasn't serving her anymore. It was actually toxic. And I'm not into pulling people out of their relationships with their parents. She's actually closer than ever with her parents. I respect and value parents wholeheartedly. And as you know, I talk about this thing called the STAR team, which is where I encourage young people, 
especially as they're starting on the journey of early adolescence, to think about who are the adults who you want to ask formally to come around you and help you navigate through these complex waters ahead so that you have yourself, you have ideally your mother, father at your base, and so many don't, so that's complicated. But who are the other adults that you're going to ask to be there late at night when you need to make a phone call, when you can't call your parents, but you need to get home safely, or something's happened and you need to talk about it, but you're not ready to talk about it with your parents? Who are those people so that every young person, as they're awakening to the incredible star that they are, actually have a team to help them navigate, and it's not just mom and dad. So in this developmental model, then we move to this next place, which I really call mentoring, where so many people, they've left home, they've started to, they're really individuating, and they're starting to cultivate their medicine and their, their gifts for the world. And there's, I love working with people at this stage. These are the people who've done the rites of passage. They really have a desire to bring something beautiful to the planet, but they need a team of people who are professionally sound and have experience and can help them create a beautiful project, be it a peace village or a whatever it is. And so that's one phase. And then there's a place where people have to actually say thank you to their mentors and they're doing their thing. It doesn't mean they're not constantly learning or constantly reaching out, but their relationship with this work, they're standing in their true voice, they're running their ship, they're making their own choices, and what I think about it actually is not that important to their um, sense of success and their success in the world or what I can contribute or any of it. It's really theirs and that's so exciting because then we really can be colleagues and psh, that's where I am with so many of the people who started off really truly with me carrying them on their back or my team carrying them together. Great. Well, that's a great uh, answer. Was great great six answers <laughs> is there anything that we haven't addressed that you want to address and I do want to be cognizant that it is three so I'm okay it's, it's, okay I'm okay this is my free time I, I, I'll need to check I have an hour and a half today to myself um, I would like to say um, again with a enormous humility that I do not know what happens in many cultures and their rites of passage initiatory processes and that in no way do I ever feel that the work we're doing replaces that. I feel that for certain souls it can complement what happens in those environments and that I really encourage people to go home and find the people who are of their lineage, who can teach them their traditional ways. And that I strongly um, am an advocate for the protection of indigenous and traditional ways on this planet. And that um, although we are not place-based, we are place-based. And that um, this work grew out of a response to a call that basically keeps being sounded by young people coming towards our community and asking for something. And as long as that is happening, we will continue to grow and change and, and respond to that call. And if ever this dance is done, we will give great thanks for what has occurred and let it go. Nice. Yeah. Well, great. I mean, I, I heard you loud and clear earlier, but that was an even nicer way of saying, making the same point. I think. Yeah, it feels so, important. Yeah. And yeah, to my way of thinking, it's very simple. It's both and. It's just both and, you know. It's, um, and yeah. then there's, it's in an ideal world, you know, every person would be offered a kind of a cultural initiation. And you have to make room for those who push back against that and don't want, a, you know, don't want that. You know, they might not, uh, they may return to it in 10, 15, 20 years, but, you know, you've got to give them opportunities that uh, accept all comers, like your work does. Can I say you another know? line that feels like I didn't weave it in, that just keeps saying, to speaking sure. to itself? Yeah. 
when you asked me what would my life have been like had I had mentors, and I really didn't know how to answer that if I, if I had had an initiatory experience in my own adolescence. Um, this work grows out of my commitment that no young person would ever have to experience being as lost as I actually was and consistently putting myself at risk in the ways that I did. That's what has propelled me forward. Not so much what would it have been, but just may it never be again. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. And that, that's a lot of my motivation too, actually. It's quite similar. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a question or a, a thought about something we might not have addressed? Oh my gosh, I don't. I feel like it's in a really thorough um, when I did, then they got answered for. Okay. You know, so I, I don't feel like I'm. Can I say one more thing? Okay. <laughs> but this is the last one. I'm never cutting. <laughs> okay. Here's the real deal. I, am, I love so much the people I get to work with. We have soul dates with each other and we're keeping them. So many of the young people that I work with, my leaders now, were born the year I graduated from high school, were 21 when we ran our first Surfing the Creative, and are now, you know, just standing as mighty oaks next to me in creating the container for this work. And so, for me, it's really back to where we started. It's about love, and it's about getting to hang out and do really cool, interesting, complex work that must be done with people that feel like family. And, and, and they are. And that came out of me looking at you and realizing what a joy it is to work with you, Blythe and to grow with you and to be in this moment with you too and see you with Frederick and it's just destiny unfolding as it as it naturally wants to. Sweet. Thank you. Let's cut. <laughs>